Hello, Perfites, and welcome back to the Perfite show, the super popular, I will, I wanted to say still the first and only uh, performance testing podcast, but uh, we have some friends around in the internet and it uh, it is fun to have more. And well, you may be asking, uh, who are these guys? I haven't seen them in so long that, uh, who is these people? <laughs> Uh, so for the ones that do not remember, I am your amigo, Leandro, also known as Señor Performo, here today coming with a special episode in a while, because uh, we're back, we're going to be doing stuff, and I have uh, my amigo, Mon Ami, Henrik. Uh, Henrik, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, I'm super fine, uh, based in France, my name is Henrik Rexed, I work for Danetrace as a cloud native advocate. And I uh, also try to produce content on the Observery world. So if you're looking for uh, content for the Observery side, check out Is It Observable? And also I start uh, today, 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 in fact, I just uh, published the first episode of the Perf Byte Francais. So Leandro, you do oh, Senior yeah. Performo or Perf Byte Espanol. And now we have the same one for the French pe- uh, French-speaking uh, audience. They have now also content for Performance Engineer. That's super exciting. Yeah, lots of news, not only uh, Perfite's uh, growing. It's silly saying it's growing since we have been thin around for a while, but uh, I promise we're going to be doing so much more stuff. We are going to be bringing, we were talking about specials and a lot of interaction. Uh, for uh, If everything goes well, this episode should be streaming at the beginnings of December and not streaming, published. It's weird how to think of things now, right? <laughs> we could just click stream and we are in the air. But, okay, we're announcing, we are giving justifications of where were we and what, which is not the point why you most probably are coming for this Perfites episode. And uh, judging by the title and what is the deal today, well, I propose this title to kind of get back on the train and ramp up, totally pun intended, uh, this show again uh, with with some topics, modern topics, modern performance. I know that we like to discuss a lot how the panorama is changing, how everything is coming up to be in our profession, uh, performance engineers, which is becoming like a blurry profession, right? No, no, a performance engineer is not anymore just that. You're just engineering. It's right? it's almost like a site reliability engineering. It's an SRE. It's a, it's there's a lot of, lot of I don't know. It, the 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 practice has been managed by different teams now, uh, and I think because of the fact that we are dealing with more complex environments and and speaking about traditional load testing in an, I would say bare metal or old fashioned technology architecture won't be very helpful for you guys. So I think it makes sense that we cover more the modern approach to give you ideas uh, and uh, maybe give you some inspirations if you have a gig uh, on running a test in a Kubernetes environment, for example. Yeah, because the, the the lines, as you were mentioning, are getting blurry, very, very blurry in between. Am I a performance engineer? Am I an SRE now? I'm doing SRE things. Some of us may be like even trying chaos experiments. Am, am I a chaos engineer now? This identity crisis that we are going through, everyone who used to be like, yeah, I just script, I overload a system and try to bring it down to see what is happening. Nowadays, we're having many differences that are starting to pop up. And I wanted to ask you, Henrik, just think of um, this aspiring performance engineer to get a job. What do you see different nowadays in the job offerings or not offerings, the requirements for someone to start on the performance trade. What do we need to know now? I think because of the the explosion, I would say, of cloud native technology, I think before we had to know about web technology, understand the concept of web, uh, which is still true. It's nothing has changed on that area. Okay. Uh, understand the concepts of few, uh, the behavior of a garbage collector, uh, of a proxy, and so on. But now, because we are in this uh, ephemeral architectures uh, with Kubernetes, with a lot of auto scaling in place, there are a lot of new things that you need to understand and uh, be somehow an expert on it. Uh, not an expert, but at least having the the, the a good suitable 
our technical background. Uh, so then you grasp at the very least, right? Yeah, I mean, because at the end, you as a, as a good performance engineer, you have to understand and provide recommendations. And specifically, if you are in an environment where you have auto scaling uh, available, then you can also think about, oh, maybe I will do less with one component and introduce auto scaling. Then I will do more with less, or whatever. Uh, but th that's that's something we didn't have in in the past, or or depending on the architecture, maybe we had it. But again, this is like a normal uh, behavior. Uh, auto scaling could be in place, uh, and there are a few things to understand. So, uh, and also, I think because now uh, when we were doing performance in, uh, gigs in the past, we were relying on the monitoring stack uh, that were basically managed by the testing tool now. And because now the observability market has exploded and open telemetry is just right on the corner, um, yep. that brings you a lot yep. of, I mean, advent advantage, to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, in the way you're going to design, your way you're going to uh, uh, build your testing strategy. And you have so much data now, which is, I don't know, a luxury, because in the past we didn't have that. Uh, so understanding all those so small components here and there, if you connect them uh, and you plug them in, uh, you will be very efficient. So I think okay. in the background, I would say understand the notion of observability, what you have at the moment and what you can do with it, plus uh, Kubernetes and also all those modern uh, load testing products that are out there, more lightweight, where you don't necessarily need a UI, uh, where you could... Um, fire load and then you use something else to do the analysis uh, i mean again you can still use traditional test testing tools for that but i think there's many many great things that has happened over the years uh especially in the in the, in, the, in this cloud native space i would say you know an another one that i having noticing that um this has started a while ago we cannot say it's completely new but the way in which now we automate our performance automations it's very different because in in the past our solutions used to be monolithic, uh, thick in in the way in which uh, that the application was served to us. Almost everything was in a single page, and we had constant uh, postbacks. And but we had stateful applications or solutions. And now with the services and microservices architecture, I think that the scripting landscape has changed drastically because. Um, I don't know if you ever had experiences trying to record, I don't know, in uh, what what was the Oracle platform that... Um, uh, uh, Oracle Application Server OS. Uh, something uh, people... Uh, uh, people can't remember. Yeah, PeopleSoft or... I know. The, the other one, Siebel, I remember. Uh, another Siebel one that was, that was ugly to automate on. And um, PeopleSoft, they sent. Yeah, or SAP. Uh, if you just take SAP, SAP yeah. it was also. Oh my God, I still yeah. it at least a little bit. But so many of these applications, when we were creating our automations, you required a, 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 an interesting skill set to be able to create this complex automation and see all this code and view states that we used to record and correlate and go crazy with. And, and nowadays, most of the time, you can get away with just an API call. Here is your HTTP get, your HTTP post. You assemble them. I like to call it like the modern Lego pieces. And then if you need the, the big load tests that we used to do, you can put them together. But now, what are we releasing? And, and that's another big difference. We are now continuous, agile, and all these modern methodologies, right? Yeah, but I think the, the advantage of this Microsoft approach is that you can basically, uh, if you, of course, uh, teach or... Uh, try to help uh, teams to do their own testing because they they, they build their components, uh, their microservices component. They do some testing about it. They sometimes do some security tests on it, and now they can also do fire some load, uh, some component level. So on, my, on the microservices, so with gRPC protocol or yeah. maybe HTTP, but. At the end, the test itself should, is very basic. It's it's a couple of lines. Sometimes you don't even need to record at the at the end because if you know your microservices, you can do it like straight away. Straight away. So that, I think that that is is um, it's basically enabling 
doing early performance engineering. And, and that that is exciting. And I think now the traditional way of doing our low test, big bang, low test, it's more like in, on the SRE side. I need to ship to production. I want to check that everything is there. I can do some chaos engineering with low testing. And, and so the, the, the overall uh, flow of testing that we used to have in the past is slowly changing. And I'm pretty convinced that uh, the Big Bang testing that we used to have will slowly be, this will be still there, but less often that we used to deal in the past. I, I, I mean, actually, I think we shouldn't have been doing those big, uh, I call it the BALT, right? The big ass load tests. I don't think we should have been running those as much as we did in the past. Uh, and even today is even less necessary because as I was saying, we are continuously pushing little pieces. Like um, it's not the Big Bang release, you just said it. It's just like, hey, in this sprint, I'm releasing this little module, so this little service, API, this new call, or I'm updating a few things. But it's not like you have to test the whole coverage and adding up these modern um, infrastructures the cloud microservices or services, you can just focus on that little piece. And especially because of that, that as well, that the big, um, big ass low test uh, perspective, I don't think it's so useful, except, and I, I keep telling that, um, except you are this unnameable uh, uh, event ticket company uh, when Taylor Swift sh uh, shows at your platform or you have a Black Friday ad, a Super Bowl ad, a Black Friday event, there you need you may need it, but that's not part of our continuous release, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah, I agree, completely agree. And also, there is something also that has changed specifically is the way features are enabled uh, on our applications. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, now we, we deliver small, small, small packages. We can deploy easily one, one update on one component. We can even do blue green deployments. So it means that we have to test basically maybe, okay, so I want to have, let's say 20% of the traffic and 80% of the new release. And then if everything goes well during a time frame of a couple of hours, then we can remove the V1 and then hundred percent goes to the V2. Uh, so that's, that's a traditional blue green deployment which I think we were, we were covering pretty well in the past. But something that I, I have a big question on my, my, my mind, now there is feature flag is taking off very aggressively on the market. Yeah. And if you think about performance, and now I say, okay, so a bunch of feature flag, I'm going to enable a few of them. So just a portion of the traffic will have this feature, which means now we are going on a new component, it's completely new, uh, that will do some new, I don't know, business logics. Uh, because to target basically on the specific uh, type of your customers. And this as a performance engineer, wow, oh, I was asking myself, uh, yeah. what would be the strategy? So do I need to figure out which feature flags? Okay, this feature flag will cover, let's say, uh, uh, 10,000 or 20,000 people. So we need to test when we enable that feature, what would happen and so on. So I think this is missing and we need to provide an answer on how you should, what would be the best methodology when you have to deal with feature flags in your on your applications. Well, yeah, and, and and this is also, uh, as you say, another level of abstraction that we need to understand, figure out. You were mentioning the feature flags, but as well, um, let's say now with uh, cloud native software, Kubernetes, uh, you have, let's say, um, a, a container with one version in a pod that has like five instances. Just let's to, to give a number, and. What you when you were saying the blue green blue green was like a big deal before, <clears throat> but I have seen and heard of some places where okay, out of the instances that I have inside of that this pod, start migrating, but just move one to the new version. It should be somewhat transparent most of the time to your uh, end users. They don't know which version they are, they are touching if the changes are not drastic enough. And you can start just sampling without actually scripting at all. If you have good inform, uh, instrumentation, good telemetry, you, I don't see much of a need actually to keep doing these automations, right? We can just do micro experiments for continuous release. I'm not saying big load tests, big load yeah, tests. Yeah, I agree, I agree, I agree. But also I think uh, to come back, uh, because you mentioned a point, and I think as a, as a, as a, as a technology that 
that the performance engineer a performance engineer needs to understand um, because at the end you would be one of the person driving maybe the settings to have a better behavior is a service mesh. Uh, because typically yeah. when you do blue green deployment you would probably use uh, a traffic split it's one of the feature covered by a uh, service mesh uh, you can do let's say you want to protect a component you can implement retry uh, retry logic or request timeout there's so many small features that is there to protect your component to avoid uh, to uh, you know that there's a limit you want to m- implement those policies and then make sure that the component won't be blast because you the, the policy should be there in place and protect your component so oh, yeah so we smash clearly if you want to have a new knowledge uh, a new skill in in uh, your portfolio uh, or your resume I would say <laughs> Kubernetes and service mesh because service mesh you'll see that there's a lot of great things uh, that uh, we didn't have in the past and now just by thinking oh I need to implement this and then boom I don't have to write code I just implement the logic and that's it and and there are it's interesting now that you mention uh, service mesh and Kubernetes because I am finding some other levels of abstraction where the knowledge from the past can be very relevant to today and in kind of weird variations because um, Kubernetes and some of the pod situation that we have internal load balancers, the problems that we had in the past with big loads and stuff like that, uh, that we had to check the configuration, how are you passing the information, it's repeating now, but in the Kubernetes uh, controllers that have to check the net- internal network of our pods and how everything is happening, that if you didn't understand from those days that we were like, hey, is your load balance around Robin or is it working this way or is it monitoring? If you don't understand how some of those things work as well, it may be difficult to pinpoint situations that will happen in Kubernetes, very similar to how they used to happen in, in bare metal. And another... I mean, I, I mean, agree. I mean, most people just forget about Kubernetes is just an orchestration layer. Mm-hmm. Sitting in in a in a, a physical machine or a virtual machine, and then it, they, it builds a, a local network. So all the limitation that we knew in the past from a physical machine in terms of CPU, in terms of port, in terms of threads, and some everything, all those stuff is still out there for Kubernetes. It's not a it's an advantage yep. of knowing those because then you say, you have those natural reactions. Say, oh, but uh, I will allocate so many ports, so uh, I will ran out of the port. I mean, that could be a situation. But uh, yeah, uh, all those things, uh, even the load balancer you mentioned, but the advantage is that in the past, we we were not able to touch that. Mm-hmm. Today, we may have the option to touch it. Uh, because at the end, it's just a, it's a YAML file. So it's a CRD, a configuration resource definition. So it's a custom object. So you can basically touch by it and modify it. So if you see that the, the 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 load balancing is not efficient, usually it's efficient. But if you see that uh, you want to make sure that Kubernetes is understanding that one of the replica or the instance of your uh, pod uh, of your uh, uh, component is dead, and you don't want to serve traffic to that, then this is where uh, like a service mesh with a circuit breaker will make the the, the great job where it's going to be basically um, removing for for a couple of to- uh, minutes uh, one of the replica one of the instance until it gets healthy again and and this type of things if you know the pa- the base logic of infrastructure and networking plus the new things then you are going to be a champion you know what you got me thinking <clears throat> with this uh, thing in the past where yeah where you needed the infrastructure god to give you access to the routing tables of the load balancer and the configurations and nowadays and a uh, little bit pardon my french uh, no pun intended uh, <laughs> eff it you can say i'm gonna get uh, and clone a little piece of the repository instantiate this little piece of code have my own yaml configure these things and I can play with it and fine tune it, uh, find the right configuration, even if you are not able, which shouldn't be the case. Most of the ca- the times you should be able to feed this YAML and collaborate because we are now another big difference that we, from what we used to have. We have access to the code. We are part of a smaller team that are collaborating. Uh, hopefully you are talking to your developers, to your infrastructure people. Everyone has some sort of communication. And you can say, hey, I'm going to have 
this is a microservice that I'm working on and I'm testing how the load balancer, I want to try another configuration. I'm going to bring it uh, uh, to my local, to whatever. And that's that's another one because some of the monolithic solutions of the past, you needed like a, a rocket size machine to have the, uh, you had to have all production, all the solution because it was the monolith, was everything or nothing. And nowadays you can just like, ah, just these little pieces. I'm going to tweak them. I'm going to play with them. Have a new YAML file, uh, probably do a pull request, send it, or even you yourself just send it to Kubernetes or however you're managing. That's a huge advantage and difference from what we used to do before, when you were mentioning earlier. Some of these automations that we had to create by reverse engineering the software, uh, recording and finding the correlations and doing all that mess. Nowadays, because in those days, even the developers were already gone. The code was compiled. Everything was just like, good luck finding the issues and trying to roll back. There was no rollback. It was <laughs> it is messy as hell. And nowadays, is I found this, or even the developer can create that type of automation, play with it, instantiate, check the load balancer. It's not only you who has kind of like, you are not the bottleneck, right? Pun intended, definitely. And some of these differences, I think... When you were saying, Henrik, engineers that are starting or that are going to keep moving in the performance testing area, Kubernetes, um, what was the other one? I can ah, mesh. Service mesh. The mesh, right? Service yeah, mesh. Service. Um, but even going at a lower level, Docker, there are so many things that containers, sadly, I have made a couple of uh professional performance engineers with several years of experience that got so used to recording, correlating, executing the monitors embedded in our super thick, heavy, humongous performance testing tools. <laughs> and <laughs> you're already laughing. <laughs> Did I bring memories? <laughs> and these, these situations were, it's not like that anymore. And these performance engineers cannot Ah, Git, that's another one that is super important nowadays that you can clone code, can collaborate and, and understand these modern social networks that are formed around our coding, our projects, our repositories. So many engineers cannot do a, a, a pull request or even like do a clone of a repository to start playing locally and do not understand this Docker, um, this container um technology that, and I, and I can't, uh, uh, myself among some of those, like not that long ago, I was like, I understand, I know that there's a Docker thing, but never touched it. And when you start to see like, oh, the disk image and okay, now there's Compose, you can just quickly bring a bunch of things uh, uh, like a magician out of the hat, everything is installed, ready to run and you don't, because remember the old days when you had to kind of download from a shared drive a bunch of code and compile it yourself or get an installer and ah, and, yeah, have the, was... and have the right uh, uh, software and everything to make the code running it was just a pain to employ deploy things and now with container it's just simplifying so much to work and, and this is what i like with with uh, kubernetes because at the end you rely on a container and if you understand the logic that you can do behind you can do crazy stuff honestly and, and some of those things were, um, I think, another... Because I, I see um, job offerings uh, for performance engineer, and it's still the JMeter knowledge that they understand test cases, that they, and that tells me that they are still having complex multi-step test cases where you have <clears throat> to definitely reverse engineer, be recording, or at the very least, understand what is the flow of these services and know what is going on I think in the front end. I think it's about a ma the maturity of the organizations. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if you still have uh, corporations that are requesting for traditional, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, being a big ass low test uh, requests uh, every okay. single month or every, sec uh, every two months, it means that they have not uh, started their journey to do continuous uh, approach, continuous yeah. testing. Because at the end, I think testing or te automation, functional yeah. testing is something that you can start 
understanding that you can put that as an automation. Perfect. But the performance has always been a challenge. We talked about it so many years because you need expertise, uh, you need to be able to analyze. But I think now uh, with the stack that is available now, this is normally, we could change that because we, we could at least run the tests, uh, get a status out of the, the tests uh, by using SLI, SLO and, and, and scoring mythologies. And then at least you have greens and, and you trust those greens. You don't have to go back and look at, uh, is it a real green? Is it a false green? Uh, at least you're saving the time where you just focus on errors. And I think if we are succeeding, uh, pushing this approach to more uh, project or, or customer or accounts, then I think the, the market will change and, and the skills requir required to to uh -oh. deliver uh, will change all the time as well. That That's a very interesting one, because uh, uh, as you were saying, skill set wise, of course, you got to understand the HTTP requests, how it uh, a back end and a front end interact with each other, how all these things uh, work, which was needed in the past. What that, I think that was more the, the biggest core of a performance tester or an engineer, depending on what level are you talking about. And just to be able to generate these uh, simulations, these automations. And for an engineer, it was just like, okay, now you understand networking, uh, databases, a little bit of uh, development so that you could catch uh, performance issues that come from the code. But now, on top of all of that, <laughs> well, I think that you can get rid of a little bit of the mess of correlation and uh, automation processes. They are not that ugly anymore. And if you are facing those, probably your software is a little bit outdated or has a weird setting. I think, I think what would be very useful for our end users is that we, we invite, for example, uh, the team from TestCube, for example, where we show uh -huh. how they can automate their test using uh, any low test, uh, we can pick one of them. Uh, and then we can implement this scoring approach to show you how it works. Um, so you can see in live what would that would really mean uh, in terms of implementations. And then from, from there, you can try it out from yourself. I think we could we could try to do some some episodes covering a few few ideas to to at least have visually uh, the concepts in mind uh, because I think we we are presenting and 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 talking is great but I think we need also to show 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 things. Each one of the things that we are mentioning are on themselves big rabbit holes that uh, yeah we need to bring someone or even among ourselves um, like dig into and untangle for the people listening to us and trying to keep up their performance skills up to date or uh, when you are, if you are listening to us and you are like, yeah, I'm, I would like to start as a performance engineer. What do I need to know, right? And just to start the ramp down, I think that we listed some of these skills that a performance engineer for this modern world uh, should have. I'm going to add one that uh, I don't think we mentioned like core. And that probably is going to be a lot of uh, what we talk about next year. Um, spoiler alert, we're going to be doing <laughs> more profits next year. But open telemetry as well. I think that understanding open telemetry and how to observe the metrics that you get from open telemetry. And, how, can be... you, and how you can utilize the open telemetry data. Because now, I mean, it's, it's I mean, we, we're not going to reveal too much, <laughs> but yeah, definitely. I think uh, it's it's a, it's in a standard for those who never heard of open telemetry. It's a standard to uh, for building standardized f structure of metrics, traces, logs, soon profiling, um, and all the all the observer vendors rely on it today. Um, but at the moment, we're mainly focusing on the observability side. But now, keep in mind that this data, which is going to be uh, structured in a common way you will have access to it. And you can still think about making a processor or something to analyze this common schema yeah. to build up or generate, understand the workload, understand the peak traffic, understand the scenarios, and understand and so on and so forth. I think it's super exciting. Uh, and I think from a performance engineer perspective, uh, I see a lot of great potentials uh, to make more efficient and reliable load tests at the end. 
Yeah. I know not only load tests, performance in general. Cause... In general, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I, I was going to mention, I just totally forgot, a few new metrics that uh, we haven't thought about, like uh, response time. Yeah, how fast does the page tell us what we are uh, querying or searching for? But we have new metrics that have uh, appeared in the landscape. How fast can a Kubernetes initiate a pod that we need for extra load that is happening? How fast is it the uh, the commissioning or destroying the pod or the services that we are not uh, using anymore? And how are these resources? Because we used to just like, hey, the RAM is going down and that's all we care and the CPU is happening. But now we have several, several CPU metrics. When you were saying this from OpenTelemetry, we are getting nowadays so much information that is super easy to drown on it. And that's another key skill. Yeah, How to I, tell which one is important. And I think we should cover metrics that are also for Kubernetes mm -hmm. or container environments. So the notion of throttling, uh, <laughs> all those co concepts needs to be understood understand precisely. Uh, because at the end, uh, this is a, a huge uh, bummer or huge problem for performance. Uh, so if you understand the concept, then, then you may be able to optimize the system. So to wrap up, let's say, let's let's list them. I, I, I mentioned open telemetry, uh, some observability principles, and to know how to uh, visualize and understand. Uh, which other, Henrik, you mentioned two more? I, I think, uh, of course, the, the basics of Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. I would say service meshes. Service mesh. Uh, I would say also every ba we we took we do we did an episode about SLI SLO, but reminding the concept of scoring. Uh, okay. Recently, Captain released uh, the Captain project released uh, the analysis definition, which is super exciting for performance engineer. Uh, so the old quality gate is back is back in the Kubernetes world. So uh, um, for those who who used to have it, they should be excited. Uh, so this I think is a huge topic because they could basically <laughs> enable automation within their organizations. I will add uh, that I mentioned Docker, uh, understand Docker and Docker Compose, because if you go straight into Kubernetes and you don't know the lower container theory where everything came from and blah, you may be a little bit like, eh? So little by little, I, I based on a personal uh, learning and growth path, Docker, Docker Compose, then probably Kubernetes, and then go with so many of the crazy things around that you can do with Kubernetes. Git. Definitely, you have to understand repositories and how to get the code easily to you. And um, I, I, our friend Almudena uh, had this like rule or minimum bar that uh, her team had to pass. Have you done a pull request first? Do you know how to do a rollback? Some of those things that are based on Kubernetes and to Docker, which uh, now that you understand Kubernetes and doing a rollback on a, on a pod that you have the history for the previous versions and you can go back, oh my God, this is so easy. And before that was just like a nightmare if you released anything into production that was ugly. So I think those would be anything that we are missing for this. Uh, I think we, if you cover the containers, we will have the, the notion of uh, uh, how resources are shared with the container environment. So what are the metrics that mm -hmm. you should pay attention? That could be interesting. But uh, at the end, yeah, I think that will be a good list to start. We probably will have extra topics that will come up in the in the this journey, <laughs> uh, this modern journey of performance engineering. I mean, but, topics uh, we're going to cover so so many. But for a modern performance engineer, skills like you would you would say like uh, uh, you're Batman and you cannot get out of the Batcave without these skills in your bat belt. Communication. Did we miss communication. Oh well, yeah. Of Being course. able to tell. Why does it matter? Explain, explain complex things to your to your three or to your four years old uh, kid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, especially because uh, this kid, we all know who are we talking about, thinks that the cloud is infinite and almighty, and you can do all you want, and the bill for the cloud will be almighty if you are not careful as well. So, oh, oh I'm thinking of something uh, that we should add in this list uh, mm -hmm. because now we used to drive performance through response times and resource usage, but people are very eager to optimize costs, optimize oh. energy. Uh, how can I make my code greener and so on? So maybe uh, introducing this concept, how can I measure the cost? How can I measure energy? Uh, that would be also something uh, useful because at the end it's an extra KPI that you can add 
uh, into your 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 testing approach. I think that falls a little bit in the communication part where um, part of what we used to have to report is like the it won't release, it's too heavy, it will bring down your uh, production server, the big box that you have in the basement. But a metric that we need to kind of be able to analyze better and understand because the cloud is very dependent on your performance to be cost efficient. And that's something that many do not understand or when they just migrate like, yeah, I'm not going to spend on bigger servers ever again. And then they get the cloud bill and like, what What's just the, happened? What the? <laughs> <laughs> right? So to wrap it, those are the skills that we think a performance engineer should have. If you think that we missed any like critical 2023 to almost 24 skills, please leave the comments below. Yep. Let us on a, a comment and stars on uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and all the media that we are going to be publishing this. And let us know if you want us to cover something and dig deeper, or if we forgot something uh, a moment ago, let us know because much more perfect is coming, right? We have some plans. This is going to be like a busy Christmas. There's going to be some uh, perfect Christmas presents coming up soon. Stay tuned. Wink, wink. Spoiler alert and all those things. And um, what else is coming, Henrik? You also have a few more news. Yeah, so Perfbytes Francais, yeah, there's a live stream next week uh, that we will happen with uh, Carrefour, uh, Octoperf. Uh, we will have a couple of live stream planned with a couple of retailers, one retailer for each episode. Um, and again, uh, it's observable. I have tons of episodes, a uh, lot of live stream coming up. But I think we should, uh, uh, what I would suggest also, if you are doing crazy things at your project, you are doing something that is really innovative and reach out to us. Uh, it would be cool to bring you to the show and, and just interview right. and, and chat about what you've been achieving. Uh, that will be very interesting to share your experience, share your stories uh, to the community. Yeah. So, so that everyone who is also kind of stumbling and you figured the, the wheel, well, that uh, not everyone listening has to reinvent it. And well, you also will get a good, cool stars for sharing something awesome that you did. And we would love to be that platform for everyone to share. Let us know. Um, so don't miss it. Is it observable? Like, subscribe as well. We will leave links here in the YouTube if you are uh, watching this on YouTube. And um, stay tuned because we will gonna have a Christmas present from the Perfites uh, friends, some probable uh, surprise guests. Let's see how this end of year party goes at Perfites. And stay tuned because we wanna do a lot more. Uh, there's so much more coming and I think that we will see you soon. So with that, Amigo Henrik, you have something else? No, I was just gonna thank you everyone for watching and see you soon for another uh, Perfite episode. Thank you very much. And as we say in Perfite Espanol, muchas gracias. And how do we say in Perfite Francais? Merci et à bientôt. <laughs> Adios. Adios. Adios.